into this afternoon's session. First person speaking this afternoon is Professor Deirdre Hollandsworth from University of Oxford, and she's going to talk about uh, mathematical modelling and accounting for social determinants. So thank you, Deirdre. I'll just share my screen, switch on my video. Here we go. Hello. Lovely. Thank you ever so much for the invitation to speak, even though I feel slightly unworthy in such a company. So thank you very much. And thank you, Alison, for that overview at the beginning. Um, you've done some really great work. So I'm uh, slightly disappointed you don't have a full talk, but I can understand organising a meeting is also a big job. So thank you also to the Gateway team. So um, I am Deirdre Hollingsworth from the University of Oxford from the Big Data Institute. I have a history of working on neglected tropical diseases. Uh, which is all about uh, social determinants of health. They're diseases which predominantly affect poor um, populations and they perpetuate the cycle of poverty. So because you're in a low income population, you're more likely to get these diseases and you're less likely to get treated, etc. And so the things that I've spent most of my time working on are how to uh, develop better interventions to um, eliminate the burden of those diseases. So. Some of my thinking in this presentation comes from that, although I've tried to focus on COVID examples. And that's why I've acknowledged my funding from the NTD Modeling Consortium. I'm also a proud member of Juniper, and uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for their part in this conference. And I am funded under that as well. And some of the work that I'm gonna mention is also funded by that. I've included this tree at the beginning, which I found online, and then of course couldn't find again in order to put the source at the bottom, my apologies. But I think it's, um, I think it's a useful visualization of all the different ways in which we try to measure social networks, social interactions, but also social determinants of our behavior, our risk, our interactions. And it is a complex picture. And I'm just going to share some thoughts about a couple of aspects of it for COVID-19. Happy to take questions as well. So early in the pandemic, I was fortunate to work with um, Matt Keeling and John Reed, reanalyzing some data which they and others uh, collected uh, several years ago through Warwick University. And it's a fantastically open data resource. So I'd encourage you all to look at it because it's one of the few data sources which presents um, contact, contact diary information uh, focused around uh, or stratified by occupation. And as you can see from this little vignette of a few people, occupations have different levels of contacts. So we have here an example of a flight attendant and firefighters who meet people in different situations, which may be associated with different levels of risk. And so early in the pandemic, we suspected that different occupations would have different risks. And we did some analysis of, of contact tracing on top of that network. But if we just think about that contact network, what does it mean for a future <coughs> future control of an epidemic and indeed who are our likely sort of sentinel populations for new outbreaks but in relation to the sorts of things we're talking about today sort of socioeconomic determinants it's not only that certain population groups may be more associated with certain occupations but that they may also be within a community who have similar populations so similar occupations so for example what if they these people who have many contacts um what if they then have many contacts, contacts in other situations? Or what if the people that they contact also have many contacts? And can you accelerate disease spread? And there's a fantastic theory of network epidemiology, which we can pull on to say how highly assorted of networks like that can accelerate spread, but may saturate very quickly. And I don't think we have a good understanding of how cross-connected these different networks are. So also during the pandemic, I was fortunate to work with, at the early years, months of the pandemic, I was fortunate to work with Rebecca Bagley and Manish Parikh from the University of Leicester. Of course, Leicester became quite a focus of, of the first wave. And we tried to think about this issue of how different correlates of risk are associated. And in particular, we were interested in the role of ethnicity uh, in transmission dynamics of COVID-19. Now, I'm not an expert in how to deliver health interventions to different ethnic groups, although I'll pass some comments on it today. But I'm going to really think about it in terms of how can we model the information that we have or provide useful modeling to inform on, on how interventions should perhaps be stratified. 
And so we, one of the things we did was we tried to map out a day of, for example, a key worker, and in particular ethnic groups who may also have particular household structures, etc. So we have an individual who's potentially in a multi-generational household. And so not only do they have more contacts in that household, but they also potentially have older contacts in that household and older people are more at risk of COVID-19. Then because they're key workers, they men then take their children to school and therefore there may or may not be transmission in the school or around the school or the event of taking the children to school. Some of these communities, those individuals may be more likely to take public transport. And then at work, if they have one of these key worker occupations, which are associated with higher contact rates, they may then again have more contacts, then they're getting public transport home, they're picking up from the school, and then they may be in more um, socially active populations in the evening time. So this was part of an effort that we made to try and identify what were the pieces of information we would need to build a transmission model which was stratified by what the information was that was available for particular ethnic groups. And the thing I'd like to stress from this is, first of all, that we didn't feel we had sufficient information to uh, provide that kind of modelling, but also that this is not just individual risk. As we all know, most people on the school are transmission, either transmission modellers or infectious disease experts. But it's not only about this individual risk, it's the risk to and from your contacts and community. And then on top of that, of course, as we all know, layered on top of that, we have differential impacts of interventions. And we don't fully understand how that is then correlated through the potential transmission network. So at that time, after the first wave, kind of looking into the autumn of 2020, we kind of had an evolving understanding of the situation. And this was a crucial report that came out uh, from the UKHSA, uh, Public Health England, as it was then. And the particular bit um, I'd like to highlight is that um, <coughs> Definitely ethnic groups were more like particular ethnic groups more likely to be diagnosed. And at this point, the analysis did not account for the fact this phylum paragraph did not account for the effect of occupation. Um, and then it was more interested in um, outcomes, so comorbidities or obesity. Um, so at that time, even several months into the pandemic, a very high risk group had been identified, but our understanding of why they were at high risk was not complete well, and was not sufficient to provide estimates of that kind of impact. Was it really a risk of acquiring infection? What were the risks of acquiring infection? Uh, and was still quite uncertain. At the same time, the Leicester Group and others were highlighting the fact that there really wasn't great information about this. So this review, um, led by Daniel Pan and Manish Parikh and others, uh, included this statement. It said that data on ethnicity was very limited in the data that was available at that time. Now the grey literature, so we're looking now in the summer of 2020, suggested there was more data coming online. And I think one of the good things that has come out of the pandemic is we do have data stratified by more different things than we did earlier in the pandemic. And that includes ethnicity. But I think this pandemic has also highlighted that we may have ethnicity, but then we don't have deprivation or we have deprivation, but we don't have something else. So it's quite hard to get a complete picture of uh, which groups are more or less at risk. And as, in parallel with that, I was involved in the Isaac Newton Institute's Infectious Diseases of Pandemics programme, and we had a meeting about uh, contact tracing, in which there was a really fantastic group of people who are actually involved in contact tracing for tuberculosis and sexually transmitted diseases. And they came up with a list of recommendations that for um, contact tracing that actually reaches these hard to reach groups. So, for example, tuberculosis is in partic very particular risk groups in the UK and also those certain sexually transmitted diseases are in groups that may be difficult to reach through standard public health interventions. And so I think it's a really interesting list of, of recommendations, but the one, sorry, apologies, which stood out to me for today was um, this issue of health literacy. So from their experience working on contact tracing in these diseases, improving health literacy was a really crucial aspect to allow people to access contact tracing and then to increase the impact of that contact tracing. So here they say that limited health literacy is associated with low use of preventative health services and of health damaging behaviours. Um, and particular groups of interest here are the elderly and black and minority ethnic communities. And it's important to co-design communication strategies with those communities. 
these are lessons that keep being learned but are well learned by these these experts so at that time um becky um, manish and myself wrote uh, uh, an opinion piece as many other people did there were many opinion pieces going around saying what could be the role of modeling in informing on this this challenge that particular ethnic groups seem to be overrepresented in uh, the, the cases of COVID. And really, we were focused on the infectious disease dynamics part of that, because at that point, it still wasn't clear for certain that it was a risk of acquisition rather than risk of severe disease that was the problem. So as infectious disease transmission modelers, we kind of think about um, infection in, in a number of different ways but important drivers of transmission from the point of view of onward transmission is the reproduction number which i'm sure you're all familiar with the r rate um, the number of infections per infectious individual at, at time t is an abbreviation of the details but it has these three component parts the probability of transmission per contact so that is really uptake of preventative things like social distancing etc that that changes that um, and then the contact rate, which we think is very different for particular occupations in the UK. So that's how many contacts a certain individual is having per day. And then potentially the duration of infectiousness. If there was treatment, then uh, which we hoped would be available and indeed is now, that would affect the duration of transmission. But also the duration of infectiousness is also associated with how quickly you isolate, that you're aware that you have COVID, that you isolate, um, that you isolate for the required time. And we know that that is all affected by your socio-demographic status. So not only is your socio-demographic status affecting your risk, but again, affecting your risk of onward transmission. So we tried to put some of the elements of this into a conceptual framework, which is detailed here. Now, for those of you who have a smaller screen, it's a little bit small because it's really quite a complex picture. And this was just a first attempt at trying to capture the interactions between all of these different factors. So, for example, here we have uh, ethnicity is associated with particular education, cultural, religion, health beliefs. It's also potentially for certain ethnic groups in certain parts of the country. It's clearly not the same everywhere. It can be associated with socio-demographic, uh, socio-economic disadvantage, and that may manifest in terms of overcrowding or poor housing quality. Um, in particular, for example, in particular migrant populations, there may be linguistic barriers to your health literacy. Migrant living in general can in, in, interfere with your ability to access uh, um, health of any kind, really health interventions of any kind, um, particularly because it's associated with food and housing insecurity, which somebody spoke about earlier. But that's only one tiny portion of one particular ethnic group. So. You know, when you talk about ethnicity, it's really important to, to really understand the diversity of this, um, this challenge uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic. And then, of course, in particular, ethnic groups are associated with particular comorbidities, um, uh, are impacted by air pollution in different ways, or maybe higher rates of smoking. And so, in terms of transmission, there's also these key worker occupations. Um, the fact that they're using public transport more, that they may be living in urban areas, and that they also may have suboptimal PPE, in particular, health, in particular key workers, uh, jobs, and also suboptimal social distancing. And there's many arrows in many directions here. And for different populations, and that's for all ethnicities, we all sit on a different place on, on how important these things are in influencing our risk of acquiring COVID and of preventing on the transmission of COVID. And we also made a list of the sorts of interventions that could be intervened along this pathway, in particular fo focusing on black and minority ethnic populations for COVID in the 19, in 19, 2020, going back a, a millennium. So I'm not going to go through those all in detail. Um, and one of the things that we were concerned about, and this really comes from my experience of working on neglected uh, tropical neglected tropical diseases is that there can be correlations in uptake of interventions and this is for a, a particular disease called lymphatic filariasis which is a worm transmitted by mosquitoes and we were doing some simulations of the probability of achieving elimination as a public health problem uh, and we if we assume there's no correlation for example between 
uh, your acquisition of infection and your probability of taking the public health intervention, which in this case is a mass drug administration and MDA. Then we got probabilities of um, elimination in this middle point here. Um, so let's just focus on this red line for a high level of, of uptake of mass drug administration. However, is there a, if there is a correlation between, uh, this must be the wrong way around, if there's a correlation between um, your probability of uh, getting the infection and your probability of not taking the intervention, you can really see dramatic drops in this probability of elimination. Uh, whereas if they are correlated, so if you if you manage to target your intervention at the people who are most likely to be infected, you get you see huge gains in terms of your probability of achieving this goal. And equally, if you have a correlation between uh, the mass drug administration and uh, the bed nets, which is another intervention which works for this disease, if you have um, people the people taking mass drug administration has been completely different from the people who take the bed nets, then actually you get the full effect, you get some effect from both interventions. If they're fully correlated and coverage is low, then actually you have a problem because you're sort of double protecting the, uh, the people who are getting all the interventions. And these sort of trade-offs are important throughout the system. So uh, in that summer, we were also asked to look at whether legally enforcing isolation might reduce transmission or not. And thanks to working with a behavioral scientist, Lucy Yardley, we were asked, well, what if it's linked to a reduction in self-reporting? Which is of course more likely in populations who find it more economically challenging to not be able to go to work through isolation. So again, I won't go into this too much detail, but we used a branching process model to look at this question. And the output, because it's a branching process model, is uh, that we looked at was the probability of a large outbreak and uh, we looked at it for a range of different control effectiveness which is things like the probability that you find you name the right contacts and then you find them and then they isolate um, and we looked at it um, sorry my screen has moved um, there we go yeah, we looked at it for increasing the incubation, uh, the isolation period. So from left to right, you increase the isolation period, legally mandating it. Um, and then as you go up, you increase the probability of self-reporting. And the question was really whether, oh, sorry, I don't know why my computer's being slow this morning. Uh, so whether if you move to a situation where people are not really isolating long enough, but you move to a situation where they are isolating more, but self-reporting, falls off a cliff because now you're um, requiring people to isolate for 14 days, um, you start to see large increases in the probability of a large outbreak. So by mandating, um, legally enforcing uh, isolation for 14 days, for example, if that is linked to a change in behaviour, which means people are less likely to report, you could potentially see a perverse outcome. And so um, we basically found that I don't know why this is, um, <clears throat> that it's probably not a good idea to legally enforce, for example, 14-day isolation, because uh, only if you are able to support people in doing that isolation and in reporting to the authorities. That's nothing to do about heterogeneities, it's just about um, drivers through the, through the um, process, drivers of behaviour. But I think it highlights again that particular groups, socio-demographic groups, will be more or less able to manage isolating for 10 to 14 days. And it was highlighted in this, these surveys by Smith et al. Um, I'm going to focus here on this yellow line, which is your intention to isolate. This is when they ask people, do you intend to isolate if you, if you have COVID for the full, um, I think it was 10 days at that stage. And then this was the actual reported behaviour. And people were not able really to stay at home for that length of time and the, the, the drivers were things like having to get food having to help someone else or having to go to work and so those are of course all tied to your socio-demographic status and it's crucial that we understand more about who's going to respond in different ways to these interventions i'm aware that i'm coming to the end of time but another thing that we've highlighted from our neglected tropical disease work is are these populations who are difficult to reach um, with health interventions also excluded from surveillance. And this is some simulations by Jess Clark going from top to bottom, uh, different levels of exclusion from surveillance. 
uh, the green line is the whole population and the blue lines are basically the, the people who you're doing surveillance in. Um, and you can see that as you increase the proportion of the population are not being observed, and they're also the people who are not accessing the intervention, you can get a really discrepant view of what you think is going on and what's really going on. And we know that reporting to test, trace and isolate and possibly access to LFDs, I've just picked up one piece of evidence, are associated with your socio-demographic um, characteristics. And I believe I've heard verbally um, that there were also challenges in recruiting particular groups to surveys. I know there's people on this call who have much more to say about that. And we really need to consider how that's impacting our ability to respond. And I think I know there's conversations going on about that all the time, but it's from a transmission dynamic point of view, it's also what biases are in the data that we're then using to inform our transmission models and estimates. So it is a, uh, there is ongoing growing understanding and challenges, and this is um, some of the data from the Office for National Statistics. Um, and they, I love that, that when they provide a report, in the end, they put a statisticians quote, which I love. And this is a, a quote associated with this report. So differences in mortality are largely explained by socio-demographic and economic factors and health. So much of the dis disparities that we saw by ethnicity were, were driven by these underlying factors. Um, but they also highlight that lower vaccination coverage in particular ethnic groups is now creating a different problem, which is that there's the particular groups who are not so well vaccinated and therefore are more at risk of infection and severe disease. So this is a problem that is ongoing. So I'm going to finish there and get my slides up. So <clears throat> I'm not an expert in providing um, health interventions to different uh, groups, but I am interested in how we can help those discussions by providing modeling analyses of available data. Um, and I think the data to date presents quite a nuanced picture. There is a continuing flow of new data and including these fantastic presentations we've seen today, but it's really important to understand these heterogeneities, not just at any particular point in time, but throughout the pandemic. Uh, and I've just picked a, a recent paper on um, COVID in Hong Kong because I like this representation of the social networks. These social networks are changing all the time and at different stages in the pandemic, they're, they're very different and it's different behaviors are going to be more important and it's going to be important not just to understand cross-sectionally but to understand something about the network beyond the person in the survey clearly a one-size-fit-all approach to interventions does not fit the needs of these very disparate groups whether it be through ethnicity or deprivation and we really need to do more to understand how to tailor interventions in a cost-effective way but i feel that at the moment we don't have as much information as we would like to in order to support that through modeling so i'm going to stop there i can see you uh, turn on your video and i'll take any questions thank you very much for your time thank you very much deirdre does anybody have any questions peter's asked a question in the chat which is um uh we don't know the strengths so he asked whether uh, how do we estimate the strengths of dependencies in this sort of conceptual framework and i think our challenge was we didn't understand which of these things were more or less important or how they were different like we we tried even to concentrate on particular groups and particular cities and we we had the end result you know we had um, severe cases really and we had some estimate of infection but we didn't really understand the risk factors for those individuals and i know that john's going to talk in the next presentation about the open safety data which i think helped some of that um hi john <laughs> but you know two years in do we fully understand why particular groups had the um, impact of the pandemic particularly in the first wave i'm not sure we fully do uh, does anybody else have any questions well while while you're thinking Deirdre, i was wondering how how do we reach these hard to reach portions of the population do you have any insight into that? <laughs> i know people who know uh, so i can comment on my interpretation of their work and i do think the um the isaac newton institute contact tracing piece actually has some good entry level uh references for people like us 
So, um, and in that, it highlights that you need to work with those communities on the communication strategies. It's not just about translating information, it's also understanding where they get their information from. So, for example, um, you know, it's not necessarily the same media that we watch, that, you know, it's very diverse across the country where you get your news from. Um, and it's also, you know, the, for example, the contact tracers in TB and um, for sexually transmitted diseases, they really know the populations they're working with. They've built a relationship with them. And of course, that wasn't possible to scale that up for, for COVID. Um, but I think over time, different you know, local authorities and have tried to work with the communities on their COVID response. And there has been that adaption and that nuancing of interventions to the local population in its many forms. And uh, there has been some successes, but you know, if we had a, a very different, uh, if we had March 2020 again, I'm not sure we would all respond in the same way that we did then. And I, it would be good to have some estimate of what that's likely to look like. All right, I think we've got another question in the chat. Uh, so he said, how well was the Isaac Newton Institute able to disseminate some of the recommendations? And were services ready to receive advice from models, even as they are different from epidemic scenarios, a different sort of audience? Yes. OK, so there's two parts to that question. So the, the Isaac Newton Institute meeting on contact tracing, which produced that report, was quite different from much of the rest of the programme, which was really about mathematical modelling, although it was stimulated by mathematical modellers. So that report um, was submitted um, to uh, the government advice system. And I know there are others on the call who could comment to how, how useful it was picked up. I think it was a challenge because TTI had to be scaled up so rapidly to really take on board some of the experience from contact tracing um, kind of on the ground by people such as are involved in that, that report. Um, yes, Julia, thank you for confirming it did go to Sage. Um, in terms of were services ready to receive advice from models, so that's also a question, I think, for the, for the group in general, happy to take any answers from the floor. I think different areas of services were uh, more or less ready. I think once it became clear that, for example, the test and trace isolate system wasn't having all the impact that was possibly hoped, um, then modelling became important in trying to understand which, which aspects were more or less important in driving that change. Um, and you know i think the behavioral scientists were really helpful in that so of course i always love talking to behavioral scientists and i always have to have it reminded to me how crucial they are for infectious disease modeling so i'm slightly sidestepping your question but i think that's because i'm not best placed to answer it in the broad that you're saying for real on the on the ground services okay thank you very much Deirdre. that's very interesting I just say, uh, Alison, it's not a question but there was a um, a comment from Kavita saying not a question but an observation in the chat. Um, she says, uh, um, they say, um, I'm struck that the take home message for me from all these presentations so far is that the current policies which focus on living with COVID are going to further entrench these SES inequalities unless COVID evolves to being a very mild disease soon. So that's just a comment from Kavita. Okay, thank you, Peter. Perhaps we can think about that later in, in the question and answer session, maybe. Uh, for now, I think we'd better move on to the next talk.